Um, so let me introduce Vern briefly. Uh, Vern joined D-Wave as CEO in 2009, uh, leading them from the transition of researching quantum computers to commercializing the world's first quantum computer. Prior to D-Wave, he was a CTO of Goldman Sachs and the founder and CEO of Edgerton, Edgenera. Sorry, uh, Vern, come on up. Thanks, Blake. I uh, really appreciate it. And thanks to the folks at Harris & Harris for inviting me. It's, a, it's an honor and pleasure to be here. So um, we, we are the world's first commercial quantum computing company. We're the only company that's ever sold a quantum computer. Uh, we did that back in 2010 with our first customer, Lockheed Martin. We've since won customers like Google and NASA and, and Los Alamos National Labs, the folks that invented computing back in the, in the 40s. So we have a, a, a very strong, growing, uh, high quality, visionary customer base. We're based in Vancouver, Canada. Um, we are about 150 employees. Uh, we have a very high mix of PhDs and scientists because as you'll see, there's a wide range of different sciences involved in this company. The barriers to entry in this field are substantial. Um, probably some of the hardest projects I've ever seen in technology. We have demonstrated the capability to solve these problems um, with scalability beyond what you can see in classical computing. And I'll explain the difference between classical and, and quantum computing. As a side effect of our, our implementation of this quantum computer, it's incredibly energy efficient, a thousand times faster, or a thousand times more efficient than today's supercomputers. So we're a fast growing company. We have 136 granted US patents, uh, a very broad patent portfolio. And we have raised a significant amount of venture capital. This company has been around for 17 years. Um, it's, a, it, it's, it's a very complex project, and we're fortunate enough to have really great top investors, uh, Harris and Harris included in that mix. So here's a kind of a simplified cartoon diagram of what, and by the way, I'm a layperson. I'm not a scientist, so I'm going to give you the, 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 the layperson's explanation of quantum computing. I look at quantum computing as explained by this graph a little bit. The, the purple line on here, there's a whole class of problems in classical computing, which are all the computers that we enjoy today in our environments. These problems scale very dramatically. The y-axis in here is the time that it takes to solve a problem, and the x-axis is the complexity of the problem. So there are all these problems that scale exponentially in, in computing today. And uh, up on the upper right, that could be centuries that it would take to use a computer to solve problems. Now, clearly, people aren't going to use the capability to, to, that takes centuries. But there are problems that are beyond the, the capability of classical computing today. The promise of quantum computing is the green line, is a scale that's dramatically lower. And I roughly characterize the point in time and history that we're at today is sort of at that crossover point. And we've demonstrated that we're starting to, to hit that area where the crossover point is. And that's where things get exciting. Quantum computing, we were the first company to demonstrate a quantum computer. We've improved the performance of it, and we're now about at that crossover point. And at that point, then you open up a whole set of applications that mankind can't do without, class, without quantum computing. And those can range from cancer diagnostics, things in the machine learning space, the artificial intelligence space, deep learning applications, where the injection of this quantum computing capability can help that that field, that, that's probably the most exciting thing going on in computer science today. Monte Carlo simulation, when I was at Goldman, that was our largest workload, doing value at risk calculations for the entire balance sheet of the firm. This firm spends $100 million running that, those calculations a year. Every bank on the street hedge fund is doing the same thing and regulated to do more and more. Those are examples of the kinds of applications that people want to do more of but can't given the constraints of, of computing today. So we'll talk a little bit more about some of those. So, so what is a quantum computer? So a quantum computer is simply a computer that directly leverages the laws of quantum mechanics to do a calculation. And as you know, in the early 20th century, the physics was revolutionized by the discovery of quantum mechanics, a completely different way of understanding the universe. All quantum computers are built with things called qubits, quantum bits. And they could be zero and one like classical bits that we all have today in our computers. But they can also be in the superposition of zero and one. So they can be zero and one at the same time. 
And this is the mysterious core of, of quantum computing, and it gives it its scalability when you start stringing these qubits together. The, and all quantum computers are built with these qubits. The problem with quantum computing, why it's so difficult, is you have to tap into this fundamentally nature, a natural process. But in order to isolate it from the environment, you have to build this very extreme apparatus. So this picture shows the inside of uh, our, our computer, and there's a chip. That chip has to run at 10 millikelvin, minus 273 degrees C, the coldest temperature in the universe that, that we're aware of, of any significant size payload. It's 400 times colder than interstellar space. So we have to run in a magnetic vacuum. We have to run in this very exotic environment to tap into the, the, the quantum mechanical nature of the computation. So the project is really we develop the chip, uh, this superconducting electronics chip. We develop the environment uh, and manage it so they can run in a data center, 7 by 24. And we develop the software and the enablement of this technology and how you would use it in a cloud environment today. That encapsulates the, the challenge of this project. The exciting thing about this is because we're using semiconductor manufacturing technology, we're able to, on a product cadence of about 12 to 18 months, uh, quadruple the number of qubits, uh, or double the number of qubits every 12 to 18 months. So it's sort of like Moore's Law, but we're at the very beginning of this quantum revolution. So this is like Intel back in 1974 when they came out with the first microprocessors. But beyond this, you know, we'll have this linear increase of the number of qubits, the, go back to the, the, the exponential slide, the capability compared to classical computing will grow exponentially. And that, that, that's what's really exciting. So our latest product was released last year, uh, uh, the, the D-Wave 2X. It was 1,000 qubits. Uh, we demonstrated up to 600 times performance improvement on our, on our last processor. It uses a modest amount of power, 25 kilowatts. Our chips themselves actually dissipate no heat, zero heat. It's only the refrigeration uh, environment that, that draws that power. And as the chip power scales up, it doesn't add any more power to it today. So all of our customers have now uh, installed this system or upgraded to this system. So our, our D-Wave 1 were released in 2010. It was the world's first quantum computer. Lockheed Martin became uh, our first customer. Our D-Wave 2 was released in 2013. It significantly outperformed all known solvers or, or off-the-shelf solvers. People were able to build specialized solvers that, that performed at the same rate. But our D-Wave 2X now is up to 600 times faster than even those best solvers. And interestingly enough, at the end of last year, Google made this pretty, I think, historic announcement that they found out, that they found a problem where the D-Wave 2 system, 2X system, is a mil 100 million times faster than an individual Intel core. 100 million times faster. So that is a strong empirical proof that we're tapping into quantum dynamics to make these calculations happen. Google published a paper on this. They did a press conference in Silicon Valley, had a large audience there. Uh, I think this will go down in the history of quantum computing as the first clear demonstration that we're past that dotted line that I showed on that slide earlier. So the applications, um, the, the, the spaces that we focus on from a horizontal point of view are in the machine learning space, the artificial intelligence space, something called sampling. This is sampling from a probability distribution. An example of that is the Monte Carlo that I talked about earlier. And optimization, so very complex optimization problems, looking, you know, doing portfolio optimization or logistics optimization, things like that. Those are horizontal uh, applications or of the technology. And then we look at from each vertical sense. So clearly the intelligence community, the defense environment, uh, the financial areas, bioinformatics, all of these are areas that, that can benefit from this, this type of technology. And we have application explorations going on with customers and partners in, in all of those areas. Machine learning, we think, is, is probably the most exciting use case of this, could even be the killer application for, for quantum computing. And this is really taking uh, a hybrid approach of the best of the classical neural net deep uh, learning approaches, combining them with probabilistic uh, quantum computing to provide better classifiers and more accurate uh, recognition and, and uh, shorter training times for machine learning applications. Um, our software environment is emerging. Um, the, sometimes I say we're a little like Intel back in 1974, where they came out with this first hardware. 
But then it was, it was Bill Gates and Paul Allen that built a, a software company to take advantage of that with the, the first compilers and operating systems and so on. We want to, our, our aspiration is to be both of those. We want to create the hardware, but also create the, the software ecosystem. Um, so we're filling in the boxes in the software ecosystem, compilers, toolkits, abstractions, reference applications, how customers will actually use this in their business workflows today. We want to guide them with that. At the same time, we're, we're um, growing an ecosystem. We actually have six or seven companies that have been founded to build software for our machine that are, that are helping uh, get this uh, capability uh, out in the world. So we're, we're very excited about that. Um, our patent portfolio is vast. This was IEEE Spectrum, the, the Journal for Electrical Engineers, a few years ago rated us as the fourth most valuable patent portfolio in the entire computer systems business. This is a small company of 150 people in Burnaby. Uh, only uh, Fujitsu, HP, and IBM had a more valuable patent portfolio than us at the time. So it, goes, it speaks to the breadth, importance uh, of the, the patents. It's going to be difficult for anyone to build a quantum computer without um, stepping on or messing with this, uh, this, this patent portfolio. IP protection is very much in the DNA of the company. We have a really strong management team. Dan Coors, who just joined us uh, four or five months ago, was with Rentech, uh, was the CFO of Global Crossing. Um, uh, Dan has been a huge help to the company already. Bo Ewald, who was the CEO of Cray Computer and Silicon Graphics, runs uh, global sales for us. Um, fantastic guy, able to get him uh, more or less out of retirement. He travels and works harder than anybody in the company and is passionate about, uh, about this technology and, and selling it into our, our customers around the world. We have a great set of investors. Uh, Steve Jurvetson from DFJ is on our board. He's also on the board of Tesla and SpaceX. True visionary investor. Alexi worked uh, for him long, long ago. Um, uh, Alexi Andreev uh, uh, has been a, a important board member for us. Uh, visionary, go-to go -to, uh, uh, board member for, for me. Um, we have other great investors like Goldman Sachs, Incutel, the investment arm of the CIA. Jeff Bezos is a, is a personal investor as well. So a really good group and we're proud to be working with these folks. Uh, fantastic board uh, as, as, as well. Our business model is sales of systems, services, and solutions. So um, typically a, a customer rents a system from us. So three or four million dollars a year annual uh, ongoing contract value. Um, we, we sign them up for a minimum of three years. To, it can go up to five years in duration. Um, and uh, the, the, they don't actually take title to the machine. We retain title to the machine. Um, there have been exceptions to that where we've actually had customers who wanted to own the machine for various security reasons and so on. But we want to create a replicable service model uh, in this. So today we work with these large customers that are visionary customers that are investing in the future of quantum computing. What happens over the next few years is this becomes a cloud service. Uh, and we'll work with the cloud partners, the major cloud companies out there to, to allow this service to be ubiquitous. That any developer anywhere in the world, you can be programming quantum computers uh, that are, are developing iOS applications that will use quantum computers. This should be just as usable a computing resource as Intel CPUs and GPUs are today. So that will be the deployment model and how we achieve uh, an even faster uh, growth in, in the business here. So we're very excited about the emergence of a, a cloud revenue stream. The basic building blocks for that are already in place. We have customers today that access machines remotely to, to Burnaby, uh, our headquarters in, uh, in Vancouver. Um, so um, we, we have an exhaustive model. These are just the highlights of it. We're, we're, we, we show, we'll show cash flow positive in 2018. It's an 80% margin business, and we've demonstrated this consistently for four or five years now. It's a very high margin business, unlike any other system business um, that, that, that I'm aware of. Um, in, in 2020, we'll have 40 customers of individual systems. A huge cloud business, but we're just modeling 40 customers of, of individual systems. Over 200 million in revenue um, and uh, 100 million in cash EBITDA. So we are looking, uh, we, we, are, we just completed the fundraising, but we are looking for uh, additional capital to invest more in software and the deployment of this uh, in other vertical areas uh, very quickly. 
So from a recent progress point of view, it's been a very busy year for us. Uh, Google made the announcement of the 100 million time speed up. That's, uh, that's fueled our business dramatically. I thank Google for, for doing that. We had a successful launch of our D-Wave uh, 2X system. Our next generation system will be coming out late this year. We'll be announcing it for delivery early next year. So again, on a very rapid product pace with dramatic improvements in performance uh, every, every 12 to 18 months. Uh, all of our customers have upgraded to the latest generation of technology, uh, even going back to Lockheed, who was our first customer. Um, we now, we fabricate our chips at, with Cypress Semiconductor, so then this uh, D-Wave 2X, we move that business to Cypress, so they're building very reliable superconducting chips. We own all the process where we build the most complex superconducting chips in the world. Uh, we have all the IP, all the recipes, we tell Cypress how to do this, uh, and it's completely proprietary to us. Um, one of the things that, that, that we have invested in is a huge amount of scientific outreach. We've published 65 peer-reviewed papers, most notably ones that, that demonstrate the quantum phenomenon that, are, that scientists look for to prove it's a quantum computer. And the reason it's, pr it's important that we prove it's a quantum computer and have proved it's a quantum computer is because it's, it's about this future and the scalability that uh, quantum uh, computation provides. So we've uh, published a paper on superposition, on entanglement and tunneling. Those are all the, the, the properties that the scientists look for and we've successfully uh, published those in peer-reviewed uh, uh, journals like Nature and Physical Review. Um, also, the, one of the controversies about D-Wave was a particular choice of type of quantum computing that we choose called quantum annealing. Um, and this is very different than what most of the world was focused on. There's another technique called gate model quantum computing that's, that's a good theory, but no one has been able to implement it at scale. And even IBM just uh, a few weeks ago announced their five qubit experiment where you could get on the cloud and see what they're doing. Um, but they also admitted that it's 10 or 15 years before there will be a useful product. The reason for that is not because we're smarter than IBM, it's because IBM made the wrong decision. They chose to, to, to go down this gate model, which is very, very difficult. So the company made some really good choices up front that are now being validated. One of them is a new US government program in quantum annealing that we're, we're, we're very friendly with and, and hope to help out with. The other is Google. So Google told us that you know, they're so excited about what we're doing, they wanted to create a quantum computing uh, uh, company within Google to build quantum annealers, uh, to have two sources. And uh, they're, they're doing that now. But they have 10 years of development and uh, a patent portfolio that, that we have to, to, to work through. So there's been a lot of activity in the quantum computing field. I, 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 I sometimes feel proud that we've really enabled a, a lot of new companies, new investment. There are startups in quantum computing. There haven't been before. We are the first. Uh, but we really do enjoy this 10 to 15 year advantage over any company, any company. There are quantum computing efforts at Google, at, at uh, Microsoft, uh, at IBM, and we are 10 to 15 years ahead. So it's, uh, we're really in an uh, interesting position there. Uh, we've made a lot of progress on the software side and, of course, granting new patents, new discoveries all the time. So to summarize, we really are at the dawn of the quantum computing age. And this capability will allow mankind to solve problems that are beyond the reach of computing today. I know that sounds grand, but I'm absolutely convinced of that. And, and you're going to see a whole revolution in computing around quantum computing. And we're the, the first. Um, we have a huge uh, IP portfolio, that 10-year lead uh, minimum that we talked about. Uh, we've introduced three generations of, of product. We're on a very disciplined product pace to, to continue to improve the performance, move down that curve that, that I showed earlier on in the presentation. Um, we're going to uh, enable it, this technology to be ubiquitous through cloud service. Um, and you know that uh, the IT business is being transformed dramatically by the cloud business. This will be another resource that will be available um, and I, I would expect that every cloud provider will need to have uh, D-Wave quantum computers in their cloud at some point. So we're building a platform of capability that we hope and I believe that we can dominate this field and create a monopoly in the field of quantum computing through our IP protection, through our, our fast execution and, and a 10-year lead. And back to that, that phone call that I got from the recruiter, the single thing that got me most interested about D-Wave is I'm a bit of a historian about you know, uh, technology and so on, and I've worked for 
uh, many computer companies over the years. I don't think any company that I'm aware of in the technology business has had the opportunity to have a 10-year solid lead on anyone else, and we do. And we're going to build a fantastic business out of that lead. So, so thank you. So uh, I guess we have a little time for questions. No, they're, they're doing an exploration. We have a very open relationship with them. They've hired a team, uh, some of the best physicists in the world. Uh, yeah, Santa Barbara, uh, UCSB, um, uh, John Martinez and team, uh, first class team. They're, taking, they're trying to do an exploration of different approaches. But I think they recognize that they're going to need to talk to us about licensing at some point. Question. Hi, how are you? Well, thank uh, you. The question is about all your patents. You mentioned earlier you had 138 patents uh, in the United States. You recently had 31 patents. Yes. Um, why did you emphasize the patents in the U.S.? Are you looking for patents outside the U.S.? We, Have you we, so far in any way had your legal department uh, defend your patents? Yeah, no, we haven't gotten into any patent prosecution or any, any defense of those. I mean, these are all filed. We, first part of your question, we file in many jurisdictions. I talk about the U.S. granted patents because they're the most valuable currency in the patent marketplace. We, we, we have hundreds of other patents in other jurisdictions, but the U.S. patents seem to be kind of the gold standard in, in, the, uh, in the patent industry. Uh, we haven't had to, pro to, to, to defend any of those patents to date, but it's certainly something that you know, we want to be prepared to do over time. Um, but right now, we, we're just building that war chest of, of patents. Every day, we're patenting another aspect of the, of the technology. Uh, no, so, sorry, there's a, this gentleman back here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you talked about a new machine later on this year. Can you, you got 1,000 qubit plus today. Can you talk about the leap to the next one? Yeah, we, we, we have public has said that it's a surprise 2,000 qubit system. Um, but its performance is not just the number of qubits. There are other improvements that are, will be made to the system that will even more dramatically improve the performance. So every generation, we're improving the all the other dimensions of performance, I.O. times, lowering noise, things like that. So, and we, we hope to be announcing that toward the end of the year. Yeah. So how many machines do you have in the field now? I think I counted five. Is that we, right? We, we don't disclose that number, but it's in that, it, you know, it's in that range. And, and so. what has been the reliability experience of the machine um, overall? Some, so the, the refrigeration technology is quite exotic and is, is probably the most uh, unreliable part of the system. And we've invested a lot in making that more reliable over time. So in, in uh, some customer sites, we've achieved over 99% uptime. We've actually had uh, one system that ran for a year without any kind of failure. So, but that's going to be a constant improvement that, that we're going to be delivering. Uh, we'll also be coming out with redundant systems for customers that need 100% availability. Yeah, it's a logical progression. You're right. Yeah. We'll take these, this question here. And, then and, and I'm around to take other questions later. So, then. Yeah. Well, that's true of all types of quantum computing. There is a thing called a universal quantum computer, which is a uh, theoretical concept. No one's actually implemented it or proved it. Um, and quantum annealing, we can build our machine into a uh, universal quantum computer. We've actually had plans to do that at some point. We actually don't know what the incremental applications are. So none of, as far as we know, in none of these applications that, that we talk about in machine learning or sampling or optimization get any benefit from building a, a universal quantum computer. So there's this really interesting, you know, there's the theoreticians and then there's the practicality. This is the practical way for the next few decades of building quantum computers. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone.